Hello, everyone. Welcome to the gathering. It's good to have you in worship. I'm live today over at our Clayton site. So if you're at Webster or McCausland, thank you so much for being with us. I'll be back there next week. But today we are starting a new sermon series called Walk This Way, Following in the Footsteps of Jesus. And I've been wanting to preach this series actually for about a year. A year ago, I remember watching uh, like cable TV news and these people were arguing about whether or not Jesus was a refugee. And it was in the kind of the height of the Syrian refugee crisis. And it became really clear to me, by listening to them, that they had a lot of ideas about Jesus, but they didn't actually know much of his story. And, and I got to thinking that that's probably not unique to cap- cable news pundits, that to some extent that's all of us. Like, all of us maybe know little snippets about who Jesus is. We think we, we know things that he cared about. We have a lot of ideas about Jesus, but do we really know his story from beginning to end? And, and that's really an important question because, of course, as Christians, we're supposed to be followers of Christ, but it's hard to follow someone if you don't know where they've been or where they're going. And so over the course of the next six weeks, we're going to fix that. We're going to learn who Jesus was. The, the way I'm structuring this series is we're going to start with Jesus' birth in Bethlehem, and every week we're going to go to a different city or town that Jesus either lived in or uh, in, in which he did a significant part of his ministry. And, and along the way, we're going to learn the whole arc of Jesus' story. We're going to learn the, the communities in which he lived and, and, the, and the history of the time. We're going to learn what influenced him But most importantly, we're going to learn the themes that would become significant in Jesus' life and ministry, and later on, significant in the lives of Christians. And so my great hope is that at the end of the series, not only will you know a lot more about who Jesus is, but you'll be inspired to follow him in new and more committed ways. Now, this series also happens to be overlapping the six weeks of Lent. So it's, Lent is that season that prepares us for Easter. So the series will end with the end of the story, with the resurrection story on Easter weekend. And so what I hope you'll do is take this season of Lent to maybe add a, a discipline to your life that you normally don't do, something that will help you connect more with God. For example, I know a lot of you want to become better at praying. Well, during the season of Lent, we have a podcast to go along with this series. The Wayward Prayer podcast is produced by The Gathering. We're going to be putting it out to help you pray each and every week. So check out the details on the screen. You can see it also in your handout. Maybe also you want to set aside some time to read the Bible. I really encourage you to try to read one of the gospel stories, Matthew, Mark, or Luke. Try one of those and read it throughout the the season of Lent. But with all that, we're going to start today. Uh, well, let's begin at the beginning with, with Jesus' birth in Bethlehem. And I want to read to you, I know a story that's very familiar because it's read every Christmas, but we're going to look at it in a new way. Let, let me read to you from Luke chapter 2, verse 1. This is about the birth of Jesus. It says this. In those days, Caesar Augustus declared that everyone throughout the empire should be enrolled in the tax lists. This first enrollment occurred when Quirinius governed Syria. And everyone went to their own cities to be enrolled. Since Joseph belonged to David's house and family line, he went up from the city of Nazareth in Galilee to David's city called Bethlehem in Judea. He went to be enrolled together with Mary, who was promised to him in marriage and who was pregnant. And while they were there, the time came for Mary to have her baby. She gave birth to her firstborn child, a son, wrapped him snugly and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the guest room. Now, I, I tend to think that like where a person was born is significant. I, I don't know if any of you think that. But I really think like to understand somebody, it's important to understand the family, the culture, the city, the times in which they were born. All of us are shaped by the people and circumstances that we were born into, even those things that we don't remember. And the exact same thing is true for Jesus. I think this is a funny thing. Jesus barely spent any of his life in Bethlehem. He was born there, maybe lived there for a year. And as far as we know, he never returned there after he first left. Yet it's the city or the place that we probably most associate with Jesus. So 
what is so significant about Bethlehem? Bethlehem is where we're going to start this journey. But why was Jesus born there? And maybe most significantly, why does it matter for us? Well, to get at the answer to that, we're going to have to learn a little bit of history. Now, I know some of you love history. Some of you, uh, maybe you didn't do so well in history in school. It's okay. But I want you to, I want you to come along with me in this because it, it's really important to understand why Bethlehem is significant. You have to go way, way back to Jesus' most famous ancestor, a man named David. Now, now, David was a young shepherd in a family in which he had seven older brothers. And, and there's a story way back in the Old Testament about a time that a prophet, the prophet's name was Samuel, he came to Bethlehem, to this town, and, and went to the house of David's father, Jesse. And he, and he told Jesse, he said, the Lord's shown me that one of your sons is set to be king. And Jesse said, well, it's got to be the, the oldest, the firstborn. So he brings out his firstborn son. The prophet said, no, that's not him. He says, okay, well, how about the second? He brings out the second. He says, no, not him. And the third, no, not the third. And he goes through seven sons uh, all, every time, the, the same thing. And there were no more sons. And the prophet said, is this, is this it? Don't you have any other sons? And, and Jesse says, well, yeah, I mean, I have a youngest, but he's young. And he's, out, he's a shepherd. He's out in the field tending to the sheep. And, and the prophet said, well, bring him here. And and so Jesse brought in a, a young uh, shepherd boy by the name of David. And, and immediately the prophet said, this is the one. And the prophet anointed David. And, and of course, David went on to, to become king. Not only any king, but he, he went on to become Israel's most famous king. Their most powerful king. The Bible says the king that was the closest to God's own heart. And when David died, the, the country of Israel would really never be the same. It didn't take too long for David's line to eventually die out, the, the kingdom to be conquered, all of it to be changed. This happened nearly a thousand years before Jesus was born, and and yet, even though David was long gone, even though his sons and his ancestors were long gone, even though the country of Israel as an independent and free place was long gone, there arose this belief, this strong belief that eventually God would raise up another king and raise up another king in the line of David to rule over Israel forever. And and so over the years, the decades, the centuries, the people of Israel still held on to this old promise that God would eventually do this. That God would raise up a king who would kick out foreign enemies, who would, who would reestablish the kingdom of Israel. And, and they began over time to call this king the anointed one, which in Hebrew is the word Messiah. In Greek, it's the word Christ. And in the Old Testament, there's a prophecy about where this Messiah, where this Christ, where this anointed one would be born. This comes from the Old Testament prophet Micah. This is chapter 5, verse 2. Listen to these words. It says, As for you, Bethlehem of Ephrathah, though you are the least significant of Judah's forces, one who is to be ruler in Israel on my behalf will come out of you. His origin is from remote times, from ancient days. Therefore, he will give them up until the time when she who is in labor gives birth. The rest of his kin will return to the people of Israel. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord. In the majesty of the name of the Lord, his God, they will dwell secure because he will surely become great throughout the earth. Now, those words were written 800 years before Jesus was ever born. And so this promise, this expectation of a king who had come from Bethlehem was old. And by Jesus' time, it was almost mythological. And so that's why Bethlehem, which, by the way, is like a, a suburb of Jerusalem, maybe six miles away, otherwise an insignificant way, place, this is why Bethlehem became hugely symbolic, not only of the past, but of all the future hopes and expectations of the people. And so with that knowledge, fast forward a thousand years. 
By this time, David's family is long gone. I mean, it's so diluted over 14 generations. It's, it's huge. It's largely unknown. It's no longer powerful. And while day-to-day, no one likely knows who's in the family or not, uh, people at that time kept records. They knew the tribes they were from. And so in the beginning of the stories about Jesus, the very first things we learn in Matthew and in Luke are that Jesus' two parents, Mary and Joseph, could trace both of their lineages all the way back to guess who? David. And even though they didn't live in in Bethlehem, this is where Jesus' story starts. It starts in the familiar place of Mary and Joseph being engaged. And, and even though they weren't from Bethlehem, the story says that you know, all of Judea was part of the Roman Empire and they called for a census for people to be counted for tax purposes. And, and in that region, what that meant is you had to go back to your ancestral home. And so the story in Luke says that Mary and Joseph, that's why all this geography is so important, traveled all the way back to Bethlehem just for some, to fulfill some government mandate. And while they were there, Mary gave birth to Jesus. And of course, what might seem like it's not that important, now that you know everything that I just taught you, you know why it's so important. It was so important because Jesus, whose parents were from long, a long ago prominent family, Jesus, who was conceived miraculously, the scripture tells us, Jesus was born in in this town that was David's city. It was the place where the future Messiah would be born. Jesus, at least according to the stars, was destined for greatness. Everything lined up. But there was this other reality about his birth, this other reality about his birth in Bethlehem that we have to pay attention to, and it's an ironic reality. On the one hand, Bethlehem shows us that that Jesus was from David's line, that he was born in the city that the Messiah was supposed to come from, that that he had the kind of conception and birth that, that a Savior would be likely to have. All of these things that point to him being the one were counterbalanced by things that puzzled people at the time. What am I talking about? Well, well, even though Jesus was born into a a prominent family in a symbolically significant place, we also learn that Jesus was not at all born in the way that they would have expected a Messiah to be born. I mean, first there's the clues about Jesus' family, that even though they were from David's line, by the time Jesus was born, they were not only poor, but they were pretty insignificant. Joseph, we learn, was a carpenter, likely like a stone worker. He made things out with tools. Uh, Mary was a devout but a poor servant girl, it says. When they get to Bethlehem, they don't even have enough means or connections or relationships to secure a place under roof, but there's no room for them in a guest house. They have to stay in kind of the equivalent of a garage. We, we know they're poor because Mary at some point sings a song in the Gospel of Luke in which she celebrates that In Jesus, God is going to overthrow the rich and powerful and lift up the poor and and lowly like Mary. None of this, by the way, fit the image of the Messiah that people had in their minds. And then in the end, it's only a few shepherds, the lowest of the low on the social ladder, that, that come to even witness and worship Jesus. And so what Bethlehem sets up, what the story sets up, is this juxtaposition of Jesus' tremendous lineage, his symbolic birthplace, along with his poor family and modest beginnings. And that tension... That Jesus was everything that they expected the Messiah to be, and yet Jesus was nothing like what they expected the Messiah to be. That tension, almost contradiction, would come to define Jesus, not only in his birth, but throughout his life. This would be a theme that would run for the rest of Jesus' life. That Jesus was the Messiah, but not in the way that people expected I was reminded of the way that Jesus was an unexpected Messiah when I had my own chance to travel to Bethlehem. Bethlehem's still there. You can go to it. I I got to go about a year ago. And and even 2,000 years later, the place is still a puzzling place to go to. Now, as you might imagine, I mean, I had been reading and hearing and 
singing about Bethlehem since I was born in the church. I've been preaching about Bethlehem for I don't know how many years. So I was so excited to go and finally see the place where Jesus was born. And I had in my head, maybe what a lot of you might have in your head, I had images of Bethlehem as this quiet, quaint, contemplative, reflective religious place, right? I mean, that's the way it's supposed to be. Oh, little town of Bethlehem says that that's how it is. But do you know what? When you go there, when you go to see the birthplace of Jesus, it is anything but what you would expect. I mean, first of all, there's a big church over the place where Jesus is supposedly born. I just want you to get this image. When you finally get there, it's not an easy place to get to. Instead of walking up a, a quaint street, you're, you're walking up a, a busy place with people going every which way. There are street vendors trying to sell you all sorts of Jesus trinkets on, on, the, on the street. As you begin to see the church, my view of the church was blocked by this. Well, let me just show you this. And if you look closely, it's not Starbucks. No, it's Stars and Bucks, the knockoff Starbucks. We even saw things like AFC was, was nearby, uh, Arab fried chicken. I mean, it's not at all like, wait, what is this? I thought this was supposed to be the place where Jesus was born. When you finally get into the church, you wait in long lines for hours before they shuffle you downstairs. You can see this crowded room room and to this place that, that looks like a fireplace and you get to kneel down. There's my son George kneeling down and there's a plaque on the ground that's supposed to be the place where Jesus was born. You have about 10 seconds before you're shuffled on and, and uh, the people behind you get to go. Well, needless to say, when we were done with that experience, not only me, but the entire group I was with, we, we, were, we were left... Uh, disappointed would probably be uh, not strong enough. I mean, there were, there were people that were frustrated and people that were discouraged and people that were disappointed and, and confused. I mean, this was supposed to be a holy moment where we would get to encounter Jesus, our Savior and Lord, and, and what we experienced was nothing like what we expected. And, and so it was the end of the day, and it was my job that day to give the devotional <laughs> And I had to stand up with, with people who, who felt disappointed and discouraged. And do and you know what, what I said to them? I, I told them that if they're feeling discouraged, if they're feeling disappointed, if, if their experience of Jesus that day was not what they would expect, then, then we have to remember that that's the way it's always been with Jesus. Friends, that's the way it's always been with Jesus. If you've ever on the one hand, believed that Jesus was Lord and Savior and Messiah and could do powerful things in your life, and on the other hand, being confused or perplexed or, or doubted or frustrated or even disappointed. That's always been the way it is with Jesus. The same thing is true for us, even right here today. And, and it's so important to start our journey there because following Jesus requires that we remain open, remembering that Jesus represents God's way, but not our own. You know, I think we, we desperately need to remember that, even in the world we live in today. I mean, we live in a place right now that is every bit as broken and sinful and tense as it was 2,000 years ago. We live in a place that desperately needs a savior. I mean, we have gunmen in schools and political division and fighting and leadership that lacks integrity and women assaulted by men and racism and poverty and sexism and drugs. And, and we want something to be done about it. I know that instinct is strong in all of us. And, and the path to salvation, the path to what change looks like, I mean, man, we have so many different ways of how we think we ought to get there. We have revolutionaries and we have reactionaries. We have zealots who, who want to get out there and, and change it immediately. And we have lawyers and political leaders. We have apathetic crowds and we have pie-in-the-sky religious folk. And each one of them today, just like back in Jesus' time, in their passion and outrage, will decide what Jesus would be doing if he was the Messiah and how Jesus ought to be acting. 
But I suspect that Jesus is leading even today in ways that often leave all of us puzzled and all of us confused and maybe sometimes all of us disappointed. Jesus' birth in Bethlehem reminds us of two very important and often contradictory themes in Jesus. That Jesus, on the one hand, really is the Savior. He really is the Messiah. And the proof is there. From, from the beginning, throughout his ministry, Jesus would demonstrate that he has, he has the power of God resting upon him. He is a Savior. He is a Lord. He is a Messiah. And through Jesus, all things are possible. And at the very same time, Jesus is going to be a Lord, a Savior, and a Messiah in ways that are completely unexpected. He will not be or do any of those things in the ways that we would predict. Or maybe sometimes even the ways that we would desire. He will always do them according to God's will and not ours. And so as we begin this, this journey of following Jesus, we have to remember that because this theme is going to pop up over and over again. We're going to be with Jesus like, yes, yes, yes. And then all of a sudden something's going to happen and we're going to say, but wait, no. I, I mean, as we begin this journey, we have to keep an open mind and, and a ready heart and willing hands. When we follow Jesus, there's going to be times when it doesn't seem like it makes sense. That it's confusing, it's contradictory, or it's even disappointing. There's going to be times when our wisdom says go left, even though Jesus is telling us to go right. And, and when those forks in the road come, we have decisions to make. And, and friends, sometimes those forks in the road, they're going, to, they're going to come in really small ways in your life. You know, things that we don't think make sense, or biblical principles that don't seem worth following. Sometimes... Following Jesus requires a patience that's, that's going to frustrate us. See, Jesus is going to want patience when we want movement. You know, sometimes Jesus is going to be teaching forgiveness when all we want is revenge. Sometimes Jesus is going to require love when, when right now we prefer anger. Sometimes Jesus is, is going to tell us that it's time to seek understanding when instead we, we, we prefer to seek outrage. Sometimes Jesus is going to force reconciliation when we want separation or action when we prefer apathy. Sometimes Jesus is going to demand justice at times when we want peace or demand peace at times that, that, that we want conflict. Sometimes Jesus is going to answer prayers in ways that you don't understand or save us precisely by not giving you what you want. Sometimes life isn't going to go nicely and neatly because you follow him. And sometimes it's when life is most tragic that we actually find redemption and, and hope. What I'm getting at is it's going to be hard to follow Jesus. And it's going to require us to be willing to suffer and to sacrifice even as we rejoice and celebrate. It's always been this way with Jesus. And it's still that way with Jesus today. And so some of you might be wondering, Matt, what's the good news here? Well, you know what? For those of you who followed Jesus for a long time, what it means is if you've ever been confused or disappointed, if you've ever felt like, yeah, I love this stuff, but I don't get this other stuff, then I want you to know that you're not alone. From the very beginning in Bethlehem, Jesus was the Messiah, but not the one that people expected. If you're newer to this, you may be wondering, Matt, why would I want to follow this guy at all if what I'm set up for is confusion and disappointment and, and, and if that's what you're thinking, then I want to tell you the reason you should follow him is this. You have to remember that just like that shepherd boy David went on to become the, the greatest king Israel would, would ever see, so Jesus became so much more than, than what the people expected and thought that he would become. If Jesus would have became the kind of king that people thought, 
Jesus would have been remembered for 30 or 40 years. After he died, he would go down in the history books as just some other guy. But instead, Jesus continues to impact the world through billions of people who believe in him. And the the same thing is true in in our lives. We, We may want Jesus to to do the things and to make the decisions that we think he ought to make. But if we're willing to to follow the unexpected Messiah, then what we'll find out is that Jesus can do something in our life that is so far beyond what we could imagine or have predicted. And so as we begin our Lenten journey, remember the place it all started, Bethlehem. Remember that Jesus is at once Everything that we have been hoping for, a Lord, a Savior, a Messiah. But he is going to lead us in ways that are completely unexpected. Our task as as followers is to allow him to lead, even when we can't see the direction that it's going. So with that, I'm going to invite you to bow your heads and and join me today in prayer. Gracious and and holy God, uh, we know on a personal level that it is so easy to follow Jesus when it makes sense and to to go our own way when it doesn't. Uh, We know in our own hearts that that at once Jesus can be our Savior and our Lord and at the same time can confuse us and, and maybe even disappoint us. And God, this... This day, I I pray that your spirit would rest upon us. Help us for the next six weeks to encounter you with open hearts, with, with ready hands, with minds that are, that are ready to receive your will and, and not our own. Help us to become better followers of the one who leads us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.